Hi, I'm Patrice Jones, and you've tuned in to In Context. Our topic today is humane education, and our guest is Lizbeth Cheraboga, who I'm so excited to talk with, who I have got in my mind today is a cow called Mocha, who was a calf. When he first came to the sanctuary, he came through a remarkable collective effort by people who saw on Facebook that a dairy farmer was going to give him away or put him on the beef truck the next morning and managed collectively to get someone to drive there, to get someone to pick up the calf and to drive to Vine Sanctuary. Mocha became a very, very favorite part of our humane education program, Barnyard Buddies. And we had the amazing opportunity to watch him growing as children were watching him grow and he was learning and they were learning from him. And uh, it was just a lovely, lovely experience for us. Um, it was also a lovely experience for me the first time I met Lisbeth Cheraboga. Lisbeth, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Patrice. It's such a pleasure to be here with you. I met you, you met me, we met each other, I think it was more than 20 years ago, uh, at an animal rights conference, and then um, were in each other's orbits for a little bit of time, and then weren't at all anymore, and now tw- I think it's been 20 years since I've actually seen your face, and it's wonderful to see your face. Uh, when I met you, I was so impressed because you had just started um, a program called Heart, which I think is... Tell me what it stood for. Humane Education Advocates Reaching Teachers. Right. And you were so young and a new graduate in education. Right. Yeah. Master right out of getting my master's of education. Yes. (laughs) Wow. So so what provoked you uh, to start an organization like that? Well, when I uh, was going through uh, the classes to get my master's in education, uh, I was also at the same time learning about veganism. And um, there was another vegan in one of my classes. So I kind of, you know, it, it's really due to her. You know, she opened my eyes. She did um, a presentation on humane education about fostering empathy for animals, humans, the earth, how it's all connected. And I was hooked. From then on, that was it. And I said, this is it. And I was actually offered a job right out of um, getting my degree in the same school I was student teaching in. And I turned it down and decided, let me try this humane education thing for a while and see how that goes. Yeah. Wow. 20 years later. <laughs> wow. Wow. But then you then you 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 did go into the classroom, right? Yes. Yeah, so um, I ran Heart for a few years. And um, as you know, it's difficult running a nonprofit organization, especially a fledgling one. And so for some stability, yes, I did go into the classroom. I started teaching in the South Bronx in New York City. And I did that for 12 years, loved it. I taught elementary school um, and always incorporated humane education, compassion for animals into the curriculum. And I just saw how the amazing impact it has on children. And um, so, you know, it's been my life for the past 20 or so years. Yeah. Okay. So, so, so you created heart humane education. Along with other people. It wasn't just me. (laughs) Right. right. Uh, So, and I remember when I met you, um, one of the things that we clicked on was sort of getting all of the connections, seeing, um, that this was also related to the environment and social injustice and and really understanding it as a holistic uh, problem and a, that required holistic solutions. And, and, and I know you built that in to heart, uh, which I think still exists online. Yes. Oh, more than online, you know, in a few different cities. They, they still do programs. I still collaborate with them, um, you know, now that I'm with TeachKind, but... 
We still collaborate on projects. Um, you know, people who are in humane education, you know, tend to just be drawn to each other. And, uh, you know, we tend to run in the same circles, collaborate on different projects, you know, all with the, the same goal, you know, fostering that that reverence for the earth and other animals as well as humans and children. And it's, it's so exciting whenever anyone sees the impact it has on children, you just instantly get so excited. Um, it's thrilling. I'm excited just thinking about it. And so I have so many things I want to ask you. And you mentioned Teach Kind, which is the organization that the project that you're with now. And I totally want to talk about Teach Kind uh, before we end today. But I can't I don't want to move too fast past your your own experiences as an elementary school teacher just incorporating humane education into your everyday teaching. What I try to impress upon teachers I work with now is that how easy it is. And the one thing you don't have to do is try to convince children to love animals. They already do. And right. since they already do, um, it engages them, not just um, emotionally, but academically as well. Mm -hmm. I've seen, you know, on the emotional side, you know, it fosters pro-social behavior in the classroom. So that's a win for everyone, including the teacher. And, you know, once you just foster that natural affinity that children have for animals, you, you see it carry over into their interactions with their peers as well. I'll give you an example. I, I was teaching kindergarten one year. I had a student who had, uh, a very rough home life. His father had been incarcerated. His mother was away a lot. So he used to take these frustrations out on the other children. And But his natural love for animals shined through that tough exterior. And so I would remind him when he started taking things out on other students, you know how you feel about the pigeons that you that you care for on the playground and you, you try to protect and make sure nobody runs after them on the playground, that feeling you have about the ants when you were just watching them, you know, in the park, you can feel that way about your friends and your peers here. And even at that young age, he started to get it. So just imagine if you just keep reinforcing that year after year, you know, what, what kind of impact it will have on children. Um, you know, I've had many, many incidents like that. I can recount that. I had a um, a class of fifth graders and I showed them a video of a puppy mill rescue. And it was very moving footage because the rescuers were had to cut the bars open with like a, a, a some kind of device because the, the bars were in the, the cages were rusted shut. Very moving images, uh, footage. And uh, at the end, one of the boys raised his hand and to poke fun at another boy who had been crying during the video. And so I paused and I just said, well, it's OK if you cry, because that just shows that you're that you care and that you're compassionate. And as soon as I said that, a bunch of other hands went up to say that they had cried during the video. So when I reflected on this, I realized that we had created a safe space. These children were not used to being able to show, let down their guard and show their emotions, their true emotions. So when we did that, it, it, it gave them the okay to, to, that it's okay to care. And, um, you know, that's a win-win for everyone. I love this so much. I'm so glad you're telling these stories. When you, when you were talking about how uh, we don't need to convince kids, to like animals, to care about animals. I know that's true. And you know, everybody knows that's true because if you look at so many books that are written to teach children various values, do it through animals. Sometimes we don't agree with those values. Um, sometimes books are written using animals to perpetrate gender stereotypes or, or other problematic ideas. But it's absolutely true that that kids just are drawn uh, to animals. And so they want to learn about animals and, and, and using animals, not using animals, not as tools, but, but um, 
drawing on that that caring for animals can lead to, as you said, um, reverence, empathy. I loved that story about how showing it's not just that you created a safe space, but you were showing a video that showed people caring for vulnerable others. And I think that probably also helped create the safe space, uh, a model of, of carers. Um, and I think that's those of us who do humane education based at sanctuaries um, are doing something similar. And it might be helpful to even be even more mindful about that, I'm thinking, of uh, using humane education to explicitly create safe spaces uh, for kids to not only learn about animals, not only learn about empathy and respect for differences and differing ways of communicating, but also uh, uh, offering kids an opportunity to tap into their own emotions, their own and empathy. animality. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, it's very, it's such a beautiful thing when you, um, and in some of the materials that, you know, I put together for, for teachers, um, create different scenarios for children to look at, um, to learn how to interact with others and other living beings and the earth. For example, you know, a pigeon with a, uh, a broken wing on the sidewalk and everyone's walking by. Mm. Well, if, if we learn about the golden rule and that we, you know, should treat others the way we want to be treated. So, you know, if you talk to children about, okay, so is, is the golden rule being followed here? And obviously it's not, how can we change it? What, what, what would make it follow, follow the golden rule? And when you, the best time to talk about what to do in different situations and is when children are not in crisis mode, <laughs> when, when things are calm and you can, they, they can be allowed to kind of, you know, let it marinate and process, you know, like, what should I do in a situation like that? Or think about in their own lives. Well, I have seen uh, a dog chained up 24 hours a day, but I didn't know what to do. And now we're talking about it so that when they do see something happening, they can draw on that foundation of knowledge and say, oh, well, okay, when we, we talked about a situa situation like that, I should tell a trusted adult. I, I have a, a phone number for uh, an animal rescuer or you know, just something they could draw on knowledge. So, and that goes the same with their peers when they're in crisis with their peers. That's not the time to start giving them tools to, uh, you know, how to calm down and everything. They need that beforehand. So it's the same thing with interactions with animals. And, you know, when you think about it, Different things like just rescuing an insect or, you know, not running, not chasing pigeons in the park. Um, these acts may seem small, but for a child still learning about the world and how to interact with other living beings, it can have an indelible impact. You know, we want children to get into the habit of being thoughtful about their actions, right? Not thoughtlessly killing or harassing other living beings and disregarding the golden rule. Whether it's an interaction with an insect, a, a pigeon, a geese, or any uh, any other animal, including including humans, we want to spark their wonder, right, and their respect for all living beings. And that that can start with even the ones that aren't so cute and cuddly, like insects and uh, you know snakes. And lizards. I love this so much because such a um, we're in such a crisis in so many ways, um, and I'm thinking right now of of climate change. But I, I think violence is there too, and 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 I I want to talk with you about that. Um, and and I think that one of the keys for humans collectively is to start to feel more connected to the larger than human world, to recognize insects and pigeons and even notice them. Yeah. Even instead of just marching through the world like you're the center of the story. Uh, and it occurs to me as you're talking that humane education does that, too. It, it situates children in a way where they are able to, to, to expand themselves and feel awe uh, at the larger than human world rather than feel like the lords of the 
Absolutely. Garden. When you talk about just sharing the world, just the idea of sharing the world that say you're walking down the street and there are some birds, you know, in a puddle, you know, bathing that, you know, what? instead of marching right through, so the birds have to fly away, maybe we'll just, you know, give them some space and, and walk around to the other side. That opens up a whole world, a different world of interacting with the world for children. So yes. that a different way of just being in the world. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Wow. And they love it. And they, and they, and they want to do more. They can't get enough of it. Uh, and, and the beautiful thing, Patrice, is that all this caring <laughs> in children, you know, can also translate to um, academics. And that's what I, I talk to schools about now, too. Um, I've seen reluctant readers below grade level, hated reading, never wanted to pick up a book, find out about the plight of animals in some way that, you know, some dogs are chained up 24 seven or um, that elephants might be extinct in their lifetime. If, you know, society continues to, you know, kill them, by you know, poaching, they find out about this and then they can't get their hands on enough books about animals to learn more. And what happens is they start reading and wanting to read. That's their motivate. That's their authentic reason. And teachers know that if, if a child doesn't it doesn't read doesn't practice reading they're not going to develop the literacy skills they need to read more and they will just fall more and more behind so that's why i try to impress upon you know educators that this is the lowest hanging fruit <laughs> you know um and you know we also had uh, a study done not too long ago with some teach kind materials are rescue stories. And I've always loved rescue stories. That's even back when the time when I was in the classroom, every day we started our morning meeting in the morning and I would always tell them about a rescue story, either my own, because <laughs> I used to rescue animals everywhere and involve children in the rescues or just some rescue I heard, just so they could hear that, what we talked about, that model of caring, that you can stand up and do something. Um, so that they would hear that constantly about rescues. And uh, so at TeachCon, we created a whole slew of rescue story texts for students to read along with comprehension questions uh, for all grades from kindergarten to 12th grade. And a teacher in New Jersey uh, did a study with 200 middle schoolers using our rescue stories. And the, the study found that this student, so now she had a, a control group and an experimental group. Now, the control group read stories that were high interest to students, like about um, bubbles and things that kids are interested in. But the, the experimental group read stories about compassion for animals. And the study found clearly that there was a significant, in, uh, that the scores were significantly better in the group that read the, the compassion for animals stories. So... When we bring this to schools to talk about, it's not only, yes, it's not only important to, you know, foster, you know, and build character and foster empathy for animals, but you know what? It helps you with academics too. And sadly, that's what schools are held accountable for. So that, that tends to be one of the things that, that, you know, will get their attention. Wow. Uh, that's just, um, that's one of the first, that's the first study uh, ever that I know of. That's, that's just amazing. amazing. And mm -hmm. I want to just shout out. So you've been mentioning Teach Kind, uh, which is a project of PETA and where you work now. And um, I want to make sure that people know that you can just go to teachkind.org yes. uh, to learn about all these things, to access these resources, to get in touch with Lizbeth if you wanted to. Uh, and, uh, and I'll make sure I say that again before the end of the show, but I just wanted to shout out that website in case anybody was getting curious about where to find these wonderful rescue stories. I, I know you've taught, um, all these different grades and we do humane education at all the different grades. Uh, but you mentioned to me before we, we started taping fifth grade. Mm. Um, and now I'm so curious uh, as to know why fifth grade uh, is a key. Yes. Yeah, so um, what we found is that at Teach Kind, you know, at, at PETA, there's also PETA Kids. Um, we've been the past couple of years I've been there. I've observed that 
um, you know, we've been giving awards and what we love to give awards to teachers and children doing wonderful things for animals. And there seems to be a pattern of children who are about the fifth grade age level do standing, stepping up, finding out about something that's going on, you know, it's some kind of plight of animals and doing something about it. Uh, we, um, so, you know, whether it's going and reading to animals at the shelter or making bow ties for dogs uh, so that they could take pictures of them at the shelter to help them get adopted, uh, starting businesses, you know, vegan businesses, all sorts of things. So um, and then when I thought about it, I realized, you know, it's not um, it's not that surprising because children at that age are they're still kind of on the kids side, but yet they are able to learn and more about abs more abstract ideas and also take action. So that's kind of, um, that was my idea with starting, uh, I've been organizing Meet the Author events at schools throughout New York City. There is uh, uh, someone in uh, New York, he goes by the Vigilante Vegan, and he wrote a children's book based on his experiences of his life growing up in Brooklyn and learning about um, how animals are being exploited and, and used. Um, and uh, so I've been organ and then how he becomes a uh, vegan and a, an animal rights activist. So that's the story of the protagonist in the book. And um, so it's for what, so what we've been doing is uh, been um, we send the book, we organize an event at a school uh, for fifth graders. We send a copy of the book, a free copy to all the fifth graders and the teachers. We provide them with academic lessons uh, about the book, talking about character, setting, plot, theme. Um, because we understand that there's expectations in a school for, you know, academic learning. So it's all got to be, you know, integrated together. And then um, we, as the culminating event, we have, uh, his name is Stuart Mitchell. We have him visit the school. And by, by the time he gets there and the kids have read his book, he's, he's welcome like a rock star. I tell you. So he walks in, the kids are screaming. Um, and then he, uh, does a presentation for them about his life story, uh, you know, and the book, what it's like to be an author and all the activism he does. And then, and what it's like to be vegan and what that means and how they, children can help animals. And then we provide free vegan chicken sandwiches for all the teachers and students who participated because in the story, uh, there's a, there's something about chickens. So we provide vegan chicken sandwiches and the schools love it. And, you know, we're not targeting, we're not, we're not, um, visit, he's not visiting schools that are all vegan by any stretch of the imagination. It's just that many schools see fifth graders as, um, you know, like they're going to middle school. We want to expose them to different perspectives. So it's kind of like a sweet spot. And we've gotten glowing recommendation letters from principals about the program. Wow. Um, and they're, and they understand that he's going in and talking about being vegan. You know, there's nothing wrong with that. It's showing a, just, just showing a different perspective because if kids don't even know that this is something normal that you can do and not eat animals and that it's okay. Um, you know, then we're not, we're not doing them, um, you know, we're doing them an injustice, you know, because we're keeping information from them. Um, you know, let's let them make their own choices, uh, but they have to have the information first. If anyone's listening and would like to have this kind of program in in their local school, you don't have to be uh, a parent or a teacher in a school to contact me and we'll see if we can, you know, reach out to the school and, and set something up. You know, we're we're looking to possibly do it virtual as well. Although it's this has all been in person. So it's very exciting. I love that so much. Um, and I love it that you mentioned that there are things that 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 you can do. I was going to ask you about that later, but just let, let's just jump in right now. So um if you're a teacher, of course, then you've already heard us say there are resources for you at Teach Kind. We've already mentioned there are a lot of organizations that do humane education. So uh, if there's a sanctuary near you, uh, it's possible they have an, a, a local 
humane education program for you to tap into. So you you, you might want to reach out to them and just see if that's something that they offer. I know that we do here at Vine Sanctuary. I know that Farm Sanctuary does uh, in, in the areas where they work. Uh, uh, or, but, but you don't, you don't have to be a teacher. You don't even have to be a parent, right? Although, of course, if you're a parent, it always is great because then you can say, hey, I want my student's class to have this, or you could talk to the teacher. But you don't have to be. If if you're a citizen uh, who's voting and paying property or any kind of taxes, and you don't even have to be a citizen. If you live somewhere, (laughs) democracy says you get to say, tell the school board uh, what what you want. And uh, folks like Lizbeth can give you tips on how to tell your local schools that you would like humane education, that you think it would be good, that you think it would be useful uh, for the kids for all the reasons that we've been talking about here. Um, and and that's something that you can do, whoever you are, wherever you are. There are schools near you. Do they have humane education programs? If not, maybe you can work to get them in there. Absolutely. And uh, another uh something else they can keep in their back pocket is that many states actually require um, some type of humane education. And um, like, for example, New York requires that um, elementary schools provide instruction in the humane treatment and protection of animals. Uh, So many educators are not aware of this. Many schools are not aware of this. Uh, Florida has an education law that requires kindness to animals be included in the curriculum at all grade levels, K to 12. California uh, encourages it as well. And a few other states, you can go at teachkind.org. We have a map where you can see the different laws, uh, you know, so you could just click on your state. Um, and so that's that's one thing that you can provide that information. And as you could ask schools, like, what are you doing to implement humane education? Because, you know, it's more than likely that they're not even aware that this is something that they should be doing and that they're not aware of the importance of it and how easy it is to implement it. And that's that's what uh, that's one thing I love doing at TeachKind is is helping educators understand this and connecting the dots for them, because really, if you work with children, you already know that they love animals. So, you know, it's just about helping them understand, OK, let's let's capitalize on that you know fact um, that they do love animals and let's see how that can be helpful and beneficial in their learning. Um, then, you know, like I've, I've traveled around the country to, um, you know, even to rural Mississippi to give workshops for teachers about how to integrate this into their curriculum. And I know that some sometimes, well, m- many times teachers tend to have like a, a some type of quote behavior problem in their class. Um, like every year there's a challenging, uh, some student who is challenging behavior. And I always ask them, you know, what's their favorite animal? Do you know what their favorite animal is? And they'll always have a story like, oh, you know, I remember they, they, wouldn't, they wouldn't stop talking because they wanted to tell the whole class about something. I'm like, well, let them and bring them books about that. Oh, but back to your question uh, about what, people in the community can do. You can do something as simple as just get, uh, you know, PETA Kids has free comic books. You could order like 30 to 50 of them and just put them in a health food store or the library. Um, That's something so simple. Anyone can do that, right? And um, you can contact us as well. I've had um, community members get us meetings with the school district. with superintendents and curriculum um, directors so that we could talk educator to educator because you kind of have to talk in that language in order for them to understand um, how this can be integrated. You can, you know, we have a listing of humane and compassionate books on our website. You can just buy a couple of those, donate them to the library. Um, One of my favorites is um, about Esther the Wonder Pig. And... um, you know, she it's, it's an adventure she has and she gets lost and her two dads go looking for her and then she's found at the end. So it's very sweet. But something is simple. We created these uh, puppets, finger finger puppets to go along with that story, as well as sequencing cards. So, again, it's so easy to be used in the classroom. And there's so many homeschoolers these days. You know, the pandemic has as since the pandemic started, 
the number of homeschoolers has skyrocketed. So we get a lot of requests for home, from homeschoolers for materials. And one homeschooler even asked us, you know, I, I'm trying to teach my children about what a vegan is. Can you create a worksheet on that? So we, we did that. So we're happy to, you know, provide, you know, any kind of support um, to, you know, any educator, anyone who wants to bring, you know, a compassion for animals into their local community, you know, to their schools, um, any way that we can help. Well, well, I, 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 I think we might be out of time. Um, I know, but I, is there, is there, are there, are there, there's so many things that have come up here from humane education as a safe space, humane education as a way to solve behavior problems, humane education as a spark for engagement with academic materials um, and a motivation to want to read. Uh, and oh, and and the idea of fifth grade as this turning point where kids uh, often will really not just be interested, but actually want to like go out and do something about a problem. Uh, this has all been just fascinating to me. So I just want to remind our audience that I'm talking to uh, Lisbeth Cheraboga, who works with teachkind.org, uh, which is how you can reach her and also see fabulous materials uh, that you could maybe use if you're a teacher or you could recommend a teacher use if you're a parent or a community member. Um, and uh, Lizbeth is also a former elementary school teacher, the found, uh, co-founder of Heart Humane Education Resources for Teachers, which is also something that you can Google and find online. Lizbeth, any other stories you want to share with us uh, before we close out this, this fabulous conversation? Oh, my goodness. I have so many. That's the problem. <laughs> um well, you, you ask them, you ask students, what's your favorite animal, right? Uh -huh. Okay, so first, what's your favorite animal? Oh, my favorite animal? That's tough. Well, it's probably elephants right now because I saw them in Botswana living in peace and freedom with their families a few years ago. Okay, and, 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 and what's your favorite student story? Well, um, one that I didn't mention was um, a student I had. This is a, another way that we see it fuels uh, the academic fire of children. Um, if anybody uh, works with English language learners, you know that newcomers to the States aren't usually the first one to volunteer to talk or raise their hand or anything because they're still learning the language, right? But I had a, a fourth grade student who, you know, just got here from Dominican, the Dominican Republic. And we read a story in, I don't think it was Scholastic News, but it was, it was some children's uh, magazine about, um, and I don't know if this is still the case, but at the time, uh, I believe it was Florida, if um, it was about gopher tortoises and mm -hmm. how they uh, burrow underneath um, the earth and that it's perfectly legal to build, you know, for developers to put buildings on top of their burrows. Um, and what happens is that the, the gopher tortoises suffocate and die. So when, she, when we read that, she, she went home, did more research. She put together a whole presentation and she asked me if she could do presentations to all the other fourth grade classes um, so that they could learn what was happening and, you know, we could kind of prevent that, you know, because because I let them know that they had a voice. And one of the you know, if they don't feel that they can do anything, one thing you can do is get a message out and tell other people. And that's how you create change by speaking up. So she created this piece that she was brand new. And uh, but she went home. She her mother was so proud, was just absolutely thrilled. And I'm so proud of her. And I don't even know her. <laughs> yes. And I yeah, I have pictures of her doing her presentation. But, you know, and that's what I mean. It's like it's so easy to do. Let's just do it. You know, I mean, it it, um, it it's a win win for everyone. Animals, humans, the, the earth. Um, we just need to do more of it. 
I'm like, writing oh. down what might be one of my new mottos. Um, it's so easy to do. Let's just do it. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Lizbeth. Uh, it's just been delightful uh, to have the chance to see you again after all these years and to talk with you about the amazing work that you've been doing, uh, well, for your whole career in education and in humane education, but right now with uh, teachkind.org, which I absolutely encourage uh, people who have tuned in to check out. Uh, if you want to see show notes from this show, or check out past episodes of In Context. You can find us in the In Context page at vinesanctuary.org. Thank you so much to our producer, Sarah Jane Blum. Thank you so much, Lizbeth, for joining us. And thank you for whatever it is you're going to do uh, to help get humane education into the schools wherever you live. Thanks. Bye. Bye.